Dr. Calvin Tan with another small talk. All right, cool. Does this work? All right, what's up? Hi. Um, I'm Calvin. I also work here. Um, so small talk today. Uh, we're already in a very kind of uh, interesting place with Hemonc, so let's get a little more granular. Um, but my talk today is going to be on um, something kind of inspired by a case that I saw in the emergency department. Um, so this is going to be a case of uh, hyperleukocytosis, then complicated by leukostasis, and just talking about um, what it is that we should be doing for these patients, uh, although they are rare if they ever come into the emergency department. So a couple quick learning points that I hope we can talk about today. Um, just want to identify signs, symptoms of leukostasis, talk about what it is very briefly, um, and then move on to management in the emergency department and then talk about appropriate disposition for these patients um, based off of how severe it can get. So I know there's a morning report given on this already, but just to quickly um, give the overview of the case, we have a 23-year-old male who presents without past medical history. His complaints include fever, fatigue, mild pharyngitis, and diarrhea for the past week. Only thing of significance from his history is that he did recently return from a trip to Miami. He was there for a carnival, apparently. Um, says he didn't partake in anything illegal, but you never know. Um, <laughs> so uh, his triage vitals were significant for tachycardia and fever, and as Dr. Sinner, you'll be happy to know, they did call a sepsis code for this patient, which is where I found him in 16 on the left. So quickly, an overview. Um, so the uh, topic here is hyperleukocytosis. So this is actually variably defined as either a white blood cell count greater than 50,000, sometimes greater than 100,000. Um, and what it ends up being is that you have um, basically giant white blood cell clumps, as you can see here. Oh, gosh. Here, kind of in the um, small um, vessels in the body, which then leads to hypoxia um, and other complications secondary to not being able to um, provide blood to the parts of your body that need it. It's mainly a pathologic diagnosis. So in the emergency department, you will mostly be making this diagnosis, or you will primarily be making this diagnosis based on clinical suspicion um, from the evidence that you have. There are two proposed mechanisms uh, of injury. One is that there's an increased viscosity secondary to the large amount of white blood cells, which causes blockage in the microvasculature and then hypoxia secondary to that. The other one is that there is uh, possibly, because these cells are immature, there's release of, um, of, um, of cytokines that can cause damage in the tissues where they are stuck. So most likely it's probably a combination of the two. Um, of note, if you are going to send a blood gas on uh, patients like this, try to send it on ice because otherwise you will have a falsely low um, oxygen level based on consumption that these immature cells will continue to have while they sit in your tube. So moving on, um, the diagnosis, again, just talking about it, it's a pathologic diagnosis, um, but for us, we'll see the white blood cells um, in the blood. We won't see the plugs. And the clinical features that would suggest leukostasis would be um, patients with an elevated white blood cell count, fever, fatigue, and then end organ system damage, uh, most commonly in the pulmonary or neuro um, areas. So the question then becomes, why is this relevant to us? These are patients we're probably going to send to Hemonc and then kind of forget about. And the real reason is that if you've been working in the ED the last week, you might know that we have boarding patients. So. If we have patients in the emergency department who get started on treatment, you might actually end up taking care of the complications that result. So, you, patients. <laughs> All right, moving on. So, treatment initiation. This is actually when it is the most dangerous for these patients. So, um, in the emergency department, you'll get a white blood cell count on your C CBC that will most likely clue you into the fact that there is some kind of uh, hematologic abnormality going on. Um, a differential will be helpful because it will actually show you uh, what, the, um, what the situation you're dealing with is. If there's a large amount of blast, more likely an acute type of leukemia, um, which is actually associated with a worse outcome. It's also important to contact Hemonc as soon as possible because for these patients, uh, initiation of chemotherapy is the only treatment that has been shown to improve long-term long mortality. Um, there have been other studies that have tried leukophoresis, um, just variable levels of transfusions, and nothing else really helps besides starting um, initiation of chemotherapy. 
So the other thing to think about is that reduction of the white blood cell count alone is not associated with an increased uh, survival benefit. In fact, there is an increased rate of intracranial hemorrhage when the white blood cell count is initially dropped after initiation of chemotherapy, which uh, a couple of papers have suggested is um, a finding that, would, that suggests that a lot of the damage is done by reperfusion injuries. So if you have clots in the microvasculature in your brain, you then reduce the white blood cell count, and then you reperfuse those areas and then start stroking out and or bleeding. Um, the other thing to note is that there is a 20 to 40 percent um, mortality rate with these patients uh, within one week of their initial presentation, that uh, patients who are symptomatic, such as the patient in our case, tend to be closer to the 40% level. Uh, here's a completely original cartoon that you did not just see in Ben's lecture. Um, the ED management in our case should focus on basically uh, maintaining a normal viscosity, or at least as close to normal as possible. For us, that means using IV fluid hydration and avoiding the one thing that we actually do need to avoid giving is red blood cells. Um, these patients may have uh, levels of anemia that would technically fall under our guidelines to transfuse. Um, but in this case, giving red blood cells to these patients may actually um, exacerbate the viscosity issues that they're having. Um, so the only thing that's really suggested as far as transfusion is platelets to maintain a count of at least 20 to 30,000, um, as Ben mentioned, to try to keep these patients out of DIC. Um, but other than that, it's mostly just going to be chemotherapy and IV fluids. Um, and then speaking of DIC, it's seen in about 40% of cases uh, in leukocytosis and leukostasis. Labs to send are listed there. Um, and then tumor lysis syndrome would be a secondary complication after initiation of therapy. Um, and in that case, we would just do what we normally do for those people. Other complications, um, the top image is actually the Alveolar, alveolar infiltrate of a patient who had leukostasis, and then the B picture is actually after initiation of chemotherapy. So respiratory symptoms are the most common um, manifestation. You'll have patients who are hypoxic and or short of breath. The other um, complication is neurologic, um, most likely bleeds or um, clots that are caused by the high level of viscosity caused by the white blood cells. Um, and then of note, you should avoid giving contrast if there is signs of kidney injury. Um, and for these patients, the disposition should be to the ICU. Um, unfortunately, that is not what happened in our case, but we'll continue talking about that going forward. So moving on, um, just to talk about what we did in this case and then go over some learning points that we could take away from this. Um, the patient was seen overnight in the emergency department. Initial white blood cell count was 74,000 with 84% blasts, um, and then noted to have a platelet count of 27. Um, hemoglobin at the time was normal, but on physical exam, he was noted to have some lethargy, some uh, um, ecchymosis along the entire dependent portion of his thorax, as well as some bleeding from his gums, which was concerning. Um, Hemonk was consulted overnight and actually came in at 1 a.m. to see the patient um, and asked us to send a bunch of different labs to help differentiate the cancer and then uh, put the patient in for a pick line for initiation of chemo the next day. That was actually done. So hospital day two, um, the pick was placed, chemo initiated, allopurinol all started. The patient was actually still boarding in the ED through hospital day two into hospital day three. Um, and you have increased slightly of the white blood cell count and slight decrements in the hemoglobin and the platelets. Hospital day three, patient has actually moved to the medicine floor. Um, and then you have, again, the labs continuing to trend in a bad way. Day four, day five, um, the patient is given some transfusions just because the counts look terrible. The medicine team, according to the notes, it looks like the medicine team did consult with um, hematology who gave the okay to give this um, one unit of pure red blood cells. Um, and then also was given a unit of platelets overnight. Day five, uneventful until about 3 a.m. in the morning on hospital day six. There's a nursing note where the patient was noted to be slightly confused and not responding appropriately. Um, but nothing was done about it. Overnight team was just made aware. Um, at 7.52 a.m. that day, there was a code 66 called to the patient's room where he was still on the medicine floor. Um, that code 66 was upgraded to a code 88. The patient was intubated for, uh, they said, um, stabilization of the airway, sent for emergent head CT due to um, troubling neurologic findings. And the patient proceeded to 99 in the CT scanner and then was moved emergently to the MICU. Um, labs drawn after arrival in the MICU are significant for the um, value seen here. The patient now has a white blood cell count of only 16, hemoglobin is 8, which is kind of interesting, 
and then a platelet count of 36. Uh, it was noted in the MICU attendings um, acceptance note that the patient at this point had been given 14 units of PRBCs, 3 FFP, 3 platelets, 2 cryoprecipitates, TXA, and Amicar. So they coded this patient quite extensively in the CT scanner. Um, the patient went on to um, code three more times in the MICU, um, and time of death was back to pronounce later that night. The final critical values that were notified to the patient are given below. Um, yeah, so it's kind of depressing. Six days later, this guy was already dead. So the take-home points to think about um, is to suspect leukostasis in patients with elevated white blood cell counts who present with constitutional neuro and or pulmonary symptoms. Um, early initiation of chemotherapy with Hemonc on board is the only... Um, is the only treatment that's been shown to have survival benefit. Management in the ED is mainly focused on hydration, maintaining um, good perfusion to the end organs as much as possible, um, and monitoring for complications such as DIC and TLS. Um, and then lastly, please make sure these patients go to the ICU where they can be monitored appropriately, um, because unfortunately that was not the case for our patients. Um, some references, and then preguntas if you have any. Yes. What do you mean? So were the last steps of treatment or were there other findings? Oh, you mean in the emergency department initially? Um, he looked infectious, so I had this, um, I discussed it with my attending because I was not certain that this was an actual sepsis code. He had no other place for having an infection. Um, but the advice that I'd gotten from that attending was just send the labs, hold off on the antibiotics, and if you find something to treat, then we'll go ahead and treat it. Um, but the labs were just sent kind of as a routine part of the workup. Yeah, that, but that was after I'd already decided that this guy looked sick and I was going to send labs anyways and were, had drawn them. Um, because I was there during the sepsis code, the nurse was already like the needle halfway in the patient's arm. So I was like, go for it. I'm sorry? He did get chemo. He was initiated on chemo on hospital date, literally the morning after, <laughs> like as soon as he got his pick line. Um, it just, yeah, it's poor outcome either way. I know this looks interesting about the space, right? So the patient should have been disposed to the ICU, probably should have been there, but he got all the right treatment anyway. So fortunately, I don't know if anything ever occurred. Why did the light not um, they think that it was just dilutional because the patient got so many products and then was basically, um, uh, anecdotally, it was told to me by uh, the residents that were in the MICU that the blood that was coming out that was drawn at that last 99 basically looked like Kool-Aid. It was like very, very um, thin, yes. So it's unclear if the patient was just losing like third spacing everything based on like just sepsis um, or being like in septic shock and just leaking everywhere. Um, I think the or the final diagnosis was that he died of actual herniation from the hemorrhage in the brain. Um, so he got the head CT. I'm sorry. Yeah, he got the head CT. It showed intraparenchymal hemorrhage. 